And okay, we are live. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Yes, we are um, excited to be hearing from David Dickinson, who is going to share some lessons from his new book, The Backyard Astronomer's Field Guide, How to Find the Best Objects the Night Sky Has to Offer, which actually just came out last week. So um, hot off the presses. I don't know about you, um, but at this uh, the way the weather has been here, where it's 90 plus degrees every day. Um, the only time really I want to be outside is after dark. And how wonderful it is to be out looking at the night sky after a day of looking at um, the screens that uh, I feel like so many of us are looking at all day long. Uh, David is an earth science teacher, a freelance science writer. He's a retired from the uh, United States Air Force and obviously a backyard astronomer. He is also the co-author of the Universe Today Ultimate Guide to Viewing the Cosmos. And he currently writes and ponders the universe as he travels the world with his wife, although that last part of it, traveling the world with his wife, is not really happening right now, but someday. Um, please feel free to ask uh, questions in the chat box, and David will answer as many of them as he can after his talk. Um, I was... Um, looking at some of the praise for David's book, and I'm not sure you can get better folks to praise your book than someone from the SETI Institute, um, who just says the book has it all. Um, he, uh, David, uh, you know, has picked out some of the best objects in the night sky um, to look at uh, stars and nebula or galaxies pinwheeling millions of light years away. Um, so without further ado, let me turn it over to David. Thanks, Eileen. Yeah, it was pretty amazing to have a lot of the, the endorsements that I had. I was especially, like, really amazed that I, I got uh, Guy Oatwell, if you're in the astronomy community, to endorse it. He, he is definitely the astronomical Yoda to everybody's Jedi wannabe out there. So um, that was quite, I, I was quite honored to have him endorse the book as well. Uh, David Dickinson, I'm based in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And like Eileen was saying, I'm a freelance science writer for Universe Today, Sky and Telescope, uh, Meteor Watch, Canada.com. Over the years, I've, I've been writing for about a decade since I got out of the military. Uh, I've traveled around the world. I am not a professional astronomer. I'm not associated with NASA. I am a very avid amateur astronomer and just reader and writer. I've never actually taken a class in astronomy per se. Uh, I've just uh, been into astronomy since the early 70s when the very first, uh, the last Apollo missions went up when I was a kid. And I got into amateur astronomy, got a little 60 millimeter Jason refractor. Uh, a lot of people remember the old refractor telescopes. And I just got into exploring the night sky from, I'm originally from northern Maine. And I was blessed to have very dark skies right on my back you're in right in my backyard on my doorstep so i could go out and on a summer like this in july there would be fireflies and there would be the milky way and it would be just that kind of pristine dark that's almost kind of legendary now uh, now that we're uh, kind of idling here in 2020 uh here sheltering in norfolk virginia my observing location is actually the parking garage rooftop we have a our apartment has a five level parking garage and the top is open and you can just take the elevator up there. And I take the telescope up there set up and it's uh, downtown Norfolk. The skies aren't that great, but I've been following Comet Neowise and a lot of other objects. And actually with this kind of the unistellar scope that I'm uh, using right now, you can do deep sky astronomy, which amazes me that you can do that from downtown uh, city like this, but it's pretty amazing. And I always say that your observatory is really where you are. You know, it's, it could be a field, it could be Northern Maine, it could be out by the lake. It could be, I've observed from downtown, uh, the strip in Las Vegas, one of the most light polluted places in the world where you could barely pick out the belt of Orion, but I've shown people stuff from the sidewalk there, you know, Hey, there's the moon, there's Jupiter, there's the belt of Orion. Um, we won't see a whole lot else, but uh, downtown St. Pete during the Necronomicon, I've observed from there. But uh, I've uh, taken up writing books uh, the last few years. I would say that writing a book is for those people that got their PhD and thought, I really wish there was something more. It's like, you know, so uh, kudos off to people that write many books, books per year. Uh, I'm amazed because it's a very long tail project. But a few years ago, 
Fraser Kane, just to give you a backstory to the current book, approached me to write the Universe Today's Ultimate Guide to Observing the Cosmos. And he had the very basic question of he wanted to get a guide out there. He noticed there's a lot of good coffee table books out there with a lot of amazing NASA imagery and Hubble photos, but we wanted to do something new and have a book where it's just, we wanted to include a lot of uh, amateur astronomer, uh, astrophotographers' contributions with photos, and he wanted to go from the basic premise of what's in the sky tonight. Now, this book rapidly expanded, and this project expanded into everything that's in my brain on amateur astronomy. Com compressed into a 200 page book. Naturally, there was more we could do. So we really had to, when you talk about amateur astronomy, you're talking about planets, deep sky objects, you know, galaxies, nebulae, clusters. You're talking about astrophotography. You're talking about choosing a telescope. You're talking about the history of amateur astronomy and astronomy leading up to what kind of objects you're seeing in the sky. You're talking about comets. You're talking about meteor showers. You're talking about watching satellites. It swiftly turned into a huge project, again, to compress this into 12 chapters in one book. So we really had to kind of go um, kind of quickly through when we did the sky from season to season. And we went through, uh, we had to satisfy ourselves with doing very best objects for each season, spring, summer, fall. Uh, in southern and northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, we kind of did a light skip through doing uh, summer and winter best objects. And at that time, I wasn't quite completely happy with the, the, the charts were kind of tiny. Uh, they're usable. They're legible. Again, we restricted ourselves to very best objects. We picked the very best, you know, a dozen best objects to see in the spring, in the summer. Uh, but we wanted to kind of expand on that a bit so enter this year's book our deep sky field guide that actually is more of something we wanted uh, versus a coffee table book yes there's some pretty astrophotography photos in here but we wanted the photos to be used to the point of maybe illustrating the actual objects that we're talking about so we went more toward using photos like this, but we also did the charts and maps. And the way we broke this book down, one of our favorite books that we had in mind that's kind of out of date now, but it's still legendary among amateur astronomers, is Burnham's Deep Sky Field Guide. This came out in the 60s. He worked at the Lowell Observatory. Uh, this is compiled out of who knows how many hundred notebooks. He did this in three volumes, went constellation by constellation, and there is just a huge wealth of uh, information in here, but it's a lot of tables. Uh, there's, you know, there's some, uh, there's some poetry in here. There's some mythology, but we kind of had this kind of format in mind. It's like, what if we took this and kind of brought it up to something that you could actually use at the eyepiece? Burnham's doesn't have a lot of wide field maps. It has some finder charts for like variable stars and double stars and things like that. Some sketch charts. And we had that kind of in mind to do something that wasn't nearly, um, we didn't want to be exhaustive, if it makes sense. We wanted to distill this down to very best objects. Think of this as a star party in a book. This is something that you can bring out there and have sitting next to you at the eyepiece. And again, we worked from Fraser's question at Universe Today of what's in the sky tonight. We worked from that basic question. If you're standing at a certain time, you're standing uh, July, and you're at you know mid northern latitude and it's 10 p.m. and the sun is set what is there that you can see so we went month by month and the monthly charts we started with we went down through and went through and looked at what the naked eye sky looks like that night as far as what's your direction when you're looking out there with no optical equipment that what direction is the ecliptic the ecliptic is the plane of the solar system that uh, in the summertime kind of rides low because you're looking out at the direction where the sun will be in six months. So it's down low. Wintertime, you're seeing a lot of the ecliptic objects riding up high in the sky from the northern hemisphere. Now that reverses in the southern hemisphere. And we cover all the southern hemisphere sky too, where we flip around. So there, there are 12 charts, one for each month for the northern hemisphere and 12 charts, one for each month in the southern hemisphere. Now, these cover, again, what the naked eye sky looks like 
your direction, we kind of give you some orientation of what constellations you're looking at on those evenings, where the Milky Way galaxy and the plane of the galaxy, some idea of, say, the direction that you're looking out along the Milky Way. Are you looking in the summertime? You're looking towards Sagittarius and Scorpius, and you're looking toward the core. You know, you won't see it, but there is a massive black hole there in the core of the galaxy that's shrouded by stars and dust called Sagittarius A star. We just know these sorts of things now from modern knowledge of radio observations, looking at seeing the orbits of these stars around the core. Uh, you might remember recently there was the, uh, the image of M87 of the massive black hole there. They still haven't imaged the black hole at the core of our galaxy, though we probably will see that from the ex extreme telescope here in a, in a few um, years once they get to that point. But we include a lot of mythology, something we didn't do in the first book that I was kind of proud of that, you know, we didn't have a chance. Mythology and sky lore is kind of a way to connect the human side with the sky and the stories that we used to sit around and tell, um, you know, early, with early man. It kind of, and I always thought it's kind of interesting to say why steady mythology and what goes on in the sky in these different stories. And I'm like, well, history kind of lays out, you know, you know, this person was king in a certain era, this battle happened in a certain era. But when you look at mythology and the stories, you see kind of what people's hopes and dreams. It's like, I think the mythology, like 20th, 21st century, still look at our movies, maybe, like Star Wars, you know, and say, okay, that that was kind of what they envisioned as their hopes and dreams and their battle of good and evil and things like that. And I think mythology kind of gives you a little look into the psyche of these people. You know, what what did they paint up there as far as their hopes and dreams as far, you know, and their what they looked for, their place in the universe. I also made a concerted effort in this book the mythology of the sky, the, the constellations that the International Astronomical Association, the 88 constellations that have come down and actually been, uh, that were codified back not quite a century ago, 1922, we're coming up in the anniversary of that, where the 88 constellations were laid out. Those are primarily the Northern Hemisphere ones, are Greek mythology, which is interesting, but um, you know, it, it's also kind of Eurocentric. So. Uh, we wanted to lay out and have some constellations, especially in the Southern Hemisphere. We had a chance to tell a few more stories that were from New Zealand, from South Africa, from Australia. Uh, and I actually learned a lot researching those. That's one thing I always like about, and I would advise anyone, when, when you write a book, be it fiction or nonfiction, when you're going through, it actually, um, you know, you learn a lot. There's things in the constellations that I learned as I had never... Uh, I've been south of the equator uh, half a dozen times, but I don't know that sky as well. And I would advise anybody, and we actually go through a lot of the Southern Hemisphere constellations, you know, go down there at least. It's worth it if you're an amateur astronomer to uh, check off the big life list ones. And that's in the book, the Southern Cross, the uh, large and small Magellanic clouds, which are satellite galaxies. And there's mythology all about these before Europeans went down there and saw these and started giving them names. The local cultures had uh, stories and tales to tell. We'll get to that here in a minute. The Colsack Nebula is another good one in the Southern Hemisphere. That's a uh, classic to go see. You realize you don't really see the Milky Way till you go down there either. So it's uh, uh, the one continent I haven't touched on yet is Antarctica, which uh, would actually be very cool to go uh, and see. Uh, from that location. You can actually see a lot of Southern Hemisphere objects from up north, and we, we talk about that too. Uh, Omega Centauri in the constellation Centaurus is, is a fine uh, open cluster or globular cluster that actually you can see uh, from Florida, uh, like, you know, about that latitude 30 or so. I've shown Omega Centauri off to people right around late April. You can also see the top of the Southern Cross. So, you know, there's some objects that are down there. You can see further down to the south than you think when you're um, looking through those areas. Now, for the second segment of the book, we wanted to go and actually start getting into telescopic objects. So you can think of the book divided off as the, the sky month by month, primarily naked eye objects and things that you're going to see. And we throw in a little, a few fun factoids 
we like to throw in some challenge objects too. So we went down mostly for astronomical objects down to about 10th magnitude, but we also uh, threw in, say, if you've never split the double-double epsilon lira, uh, that's a famous quadruple star. These are more telescopic objects. If you've never seen a quasar, uh, there is a 3C273. There is a 14th magnitude, which is still really faint. But, you know, you can see with a backyard object. And just it's one of those things we like to try to give the perspective out in time and space. Yes, it's a little dot. But when you realize that little dot is several billion light years away, you're seeing something out there that the light left there before there were humans uh, or a lot of the life on Earth. So that is really kind of a stupendous thing to think about, even though you're looking at just a little tiny faint smudge. Now, in the second part of the book, like I said, I give a, a good close up here. We actually get into sky maps. We divided the sky off into 20 sections. That's northern and southern hemisphere. And we went through those sections and did the very best objects. Uh, my thinking when I did these tables, because otherwise, like I said, we only had an even, and we had to trim down some room to make, make the, the page count for the book. So we had to go down, and the idea I had is we're going to only list the very best objects down to 10th magnitude. 10th magnitude is what I would consider um, small telescope uh, binocular range. We're talking about the magnitude scale. The higher the number gets, the fainter the object. And I always like to think the brightest stars are like serious and that's about magnitude negative one. There's only a few stars that are in the negative magnitudes. Negative one down to six, and we describe all this. There's a section in the book, so I don't want people to feel intimidated. We give you the very basic how you find directions in the sky. There's uh, azimuth and altitude is analogous to finding so how many degrees is something is above the horizon and where on the horizon it is. Right ascension and declination is like, think of latitude and longitude. If you project the Earth into a sphere out beyond the Earth, this is imaginary now, but it's from our Earthbound perspective, this kind of coordinate system works. Right ascension and declination is the position in the sky that's analogous to latitude and longitude, terrestrial latitude and longitude on the Earth. So we go through that whole thing, and the charts are marked off with latitude and longitude. Incidentally, there is a reason these are, um, all the charts in this book are black and white. They're black stars on a white background. When you are using a red headlamp, this is a much easier, this was designed to read out in the field. Let's see if I can get my light to go red here. Anyway. This was designed to read out in the field. This does have a red setting on it. It's got so many settings that it's, I would have to dial through them all to find it again. But uh, designed to use out in the field at the eyepiece, and you use a red light in astronomy to preserve your night vision. You don't want to blind yourself or blind other people out there. Uh, you want your eyes to stay dark adapted. And these maps, uh, when I was doing the printed out test runs in the beta versions of these, and I was bringing them star parties, uh, back when we could do star parties, in person and testing them. I actually brought this, like say in our bathroom here in our apartment, uh, clothed, this, this is the life of a writer, uh, closed off all the doors and turned out all the lights and had my red light in there to simulate. And I'm like, okay, can I read these? I've actually seen astronomy um, maps. This is a good guide that I've used for years, but when you use yellow, on your stars and, and things, they tend to, it disappears. There are colors that will disappear um, under a red light. So it kind of makes it difficult to read out in the field. There's not a, a lot of really, there's some really good classic uh, astronomy charts and maps out there like Norton's. I haven't seen anything done recently. Like I said, it seems like more astronomy books and there's nothing wrong with that to do. This was a very good coffee table book, not such a good in the field book. So we kind of wanted to strip this down get to the point where this is something our fondest hope is that you'll go out, use this at the eyepiece. It will become something that's, you know, dog-eared. You've got pages folded. You've got, I've already got, uh, you know, post-its through it. Uh, a very good section you want to post it if you already have this book is toward the beginning of the second section. You're going to find yourself going back and forth to this. The very beginning of the all-sky charts, 
there is a key, northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. This numbers all the charts down, all 20 from number one is the polar chart. And that goes down from 90 degrees. I went 90 degrees north down to 60 degrees north. And the polar chart covers that whole swath. Again, that's quite ambitious, but I think I made the maps. I, I, I consciously wanted to make these maps legible and easy to read at the eyepiece. And again, we selected out best objects. So we're not listing every like uh, obscure uh, 15th magnitude galaxy or stars that are, are of absolutely no interest. We list double stars down to our thinking was um, ha double stars that have a separation of more than an arc second because uh, less than an arc second, they're very hard to separate at the eyepiece. And our both components are brighter than 10th magnitude. So that assured we only got down through that filter of very uh, uh, good double stars that are worth seeing, like Algeba in Leo, uh, Iota Cancri, Elbirio, you know, a lot of the, you know, the very famous, but you know, there's some double stars. I learned some that were really amazing doubles. I was up every clear night kind of examining some of these to kind of give the book a little bit of ground truth. And there, there were some double stars uh, that I had never seen before. We cover variable stars. We cover categories of variable stars, like cataclysmic variables. But again, we tended to do variables that were only brighter than 10th magnitude and had a pretty good variation swing. So again, we're doing Algol, we're doing Z Camelopardalis, we're doing uh, Eugeminorum, we're doing a lot of the uh, classic ones. We do a whole table of the best cataclysmic uh, uh, variable stars. We do uh, the best white dwarfs for backyard telescopes. We do the best red dwarfs for backyard telescopes. Um, I always thought it's ironic in the idea of red dwarfs. And we have a chapter on astrophysics in here that is uh, very brief. So not to scare anybody away, but I, I wanted to, something we didn't do a lot, this book we talk more about observational astronomy, what things look like and what you're seeing. What I wanted to get into is what these objects actually are, because uh, when you're doing a star party, again, the concept of doing a star party in a book, you want to try to um, explain, you know, the, uh, the lives of stars, how stars, uh, how elements are created. How do we know what these stars are made of? You know, what is spectroscopy? What is interferometry? These are kind of uh, scary concepts because you, when you get into a question, a very basic question, you know, when you say that, um, uh, say, a certain cluster is a thousand light years away. And I specifically listed on all the tables all the distances, which was its own research project, actually. You get into the question of, well, how do we know how far away something is like that? And that really gets into, um, I think I'm still alive. Seems like I'm frozen. David? Yes, uh, I was just kind of, I was, I, my, my feed froze there for a second. So I wasn't <laughs> sure if I'm still alive or not. Nope, you're still alive. Okay, good. This actually happened on the Cosmo Quest uh, when we were doing the, uh, we were on Discord and I talked for about half an hour and I found out later on, oh, I was just talking to the room. So, <laughs> so cool. And for some reason, the feed froze up there, but I don't think it was frozen for, for very long. Okay. Um, yeah, we go through astrophysics in the book uh, just with an idea of trying to explain those basic questions you get out at a star party. How do you, when, when you want to describe, say, how far something away is, you know, it's a very basic question, but then it gets into standard candle measurements. So we go over very basically, like you would get in an astronomy 101 class. It's like, okay, when you're trying to measure something really close, something, uh, a method called parallax works, where you imagine looking from two observatories or either side of the Earth's orbit and you have that baseline and you're looking at the star very far away and you're looking for it to shift along the background. Like if you look at something with your finger and you blink one eye to the other, it shifts against the farther background. But then when you get further out there, you have to describe things like, well, there's objects known as Cypheid variables, which are standard candles, which are a type of star that varies intrinsically, but in a predictable way that we can look at and if you can find, like Polaris, uh, the North Star, is uh, one of the closest Cypheid variables 
in the, in the sky, which is one of these types of variable stars. So if you can find something like that in a uh, cluster or galaxy, then you can look at it and say, ha, ah, there's a star varying like what we know Cepheids vary like up close, like Polaris or Delta Cephei. And you can measure burst based on light uh, fades off intrinsically the further it's, it's put away from you. Like if something is twice as far away, it's one fourth as bright, the inverse square. And if it's three times away, it's one ninth as bright, five times far away, one twenty fifth as bright. But, you know, this, these are all very basic. It's, it's tough to get these concepts down. You're talking about concepts that we came around that took centuries for astronomers to come up with that are um, also try to impress on people. These are redundant ideas. Like when you talk about cosmology and the Big Bang, that's one that a lot of people um, might have some problem with. But you're like, well, there are multiple lines of evidence out there. It's what I try to stress uh, with people that, um, and you know, we're still testing these theories. There are ideas out there. We're looking at the cosmic microwave background was a prediction that was put out there that they found in the 60s that said if the Big Bang theory of cosmology was true. But there are other things out there that we, we also don't see like any white dwarfs that have lasted longer than the age of the universe because white dwarfs would take the universe is only 13.7 billion years old. You know, there's all these different pillars and lines of of uh, in there of of uh, findings out there that point toward. We very briefly cover this sort of stuff in here. We had to actually edit that chapter down. Um, I kind of wanted it to be a little longer, but because these are really complex but fascinating ideas, and I think to get these across are really important. And I try to do that when we're out at the star party. How elements are made. You know, the gold in my wedding ring was made out there somewhere you know, in a neutron star merger, or it was made, a lot of elements were made in supernova explosions. It's like, that is really amazing to think that's kind of stuff is just scattered around my house, you know, those sorts of things. But it's, uh, we try to bring in a little bit of that um, kind of wow factor. And as a matter of fact, I wanted to read some very brief sections. Um, I won't be too long on this because I've kind of gone a long ways. But uh, the very, talking about the wow factor in astrophysics 101, here's just to give you an idea of what I was just talking about. Part of the fun of stargazing is knowing just what you're seeing. Sure, a star is just a point of light, but to know that a star is another sun, much more massive than our own, is to realize just one small but wonderful facet of the universe we inhabit. But the deep sky does not give up its secrets easily. One of the most common questions I hear at star parties is, what is that? The question is often followed by another common question that is much more difficult to answer. Is how do we know that? For example, it always amazes me how much we take for granted in the following statement. The stars are suns, but they are far away. The sun is a star, but the closest one to the Earth. Nebulae are star-forming regions, places where gas and dust are collapsing and just starting to shine via nuclear fusion. The sun is about midway through its 10 billion year lifespan. The sun is just one of billions of stars orbiting the Milky Way galaxy. Our galaxy is littered with hundreds of star clusters, some tight and densely packed, some loose and open. It's also cluttered with tiny planetary nebulae, the leftover, which are the leftover corpses of dead stars to include white dwarfs, pulsars, and black holes. A massive black hole known as Sagittarius A, pronounced A star, lurks at our galaxy's center. The universe, in turn, contains billions of galaxies that got its start 13.8 billion years ago during the Big Bang. That's a lot to take in for sure. And that's just, you know, that's our modern conception of astrophysics and astronomy in a paragraph, which is something that really amazes me that I think of all the astronomers from Galileo to Newton to Hubble to would have loved to known what that some of the facts I just stated in that paragraph to kind of look over my shoulder. I think of like when I photocopy the periodic table and hand that out for students to use for a test. And I tell them it's like you have something that is hundreds and thousands of years of hard won knowledge that we can just run off. Uh, you can put on a T-shirt now that you can take. And, you know, you think of how many chemists before Mendeleev took and intuitively laid out that strange blocky shape you see the periodic table and said, gave it that predictive power and said, 
these little gaps that you see here, there's elements we haven't found out there. That's science. That's predictive science. And the astronomy does that same thing. Again, it's uh, when you're saying this predicts something, you should look out there observationally. If, you, if, if Y is true, you should see X. So if we see X, we're like, yes, this theory, uh, that lends more weight to that theory. If we don't see X, that means the uh, theory Y has to go back to the board. But I think it's important to get that bit of concept across um, all too often in amateur astronomy. And there's nothing wrong with taking pretty pictures and looking out there and saying, hey, there's another galaxy. That's kind of cool. But to know what these things are, sometimes, like I was talking about with quasars, when you're looking in amateur astronomy, you're actually um, you're seeing something that's a dot. Me and a friend of mine in South Africa, Corey Schmidt, we just did a webcast where he took it from his backyard and watched a, an asteroid occult, a 14th magnitude star. Now, this asteroid was a uh, Kuiper Belt object, and it's one that is, uh, was just discovered in 2002. And we did this whole event for an hour just to watch one star for 30 seconds go wink, blackout, and the asteroid passed in front, and then come back. It is, on one hand, something that if you have no idea what you're looking at, you're kind of like, oh, whatever. It's like, I saw something pass in front of a star. Wow. But when you think of all the factors that go into it, I think a lot of things in astronomy you're starting to see. Uh, that's a trans-Neptunian object. We didn't even know about those things uh, until, you know, within the last half century. Uh, we don't know how, what does this one look like up close? Does it look like Erikoth that New Horizons flew by or Pluto or Charon or, you know, we don't know. It's just a little pinpoint star. That star it blocked out is probably the size of our sun, but it's like a thousand light years away. So it's really faint. 14th magnitude is extremely faint. I was impressed that he could catch that kind of event. But, you know, you can use this kind of guidebook to, uh, I might do one more. Actually... Let's read a little section from the Northern Sky. I think that would, yeah, that, that'll about wrap us up. The Northern July Sky, if like many residents in the Northern Hemisphere, you find yourself camping in mid-July, be sure to take the opportunity to check out the night sky from a dark sky site. Two key points in the sky give an observer a perspective on our place and direction in the Milky Way galaxy. First is the direction we're headed along with our sun in the rest of the solar system known as the solar apex. This was discovered by Sir William Herschel in 1783 during an early survey of the proper motion of nearby stars. Herschel placed the solar apex near the star Omicron Hercules, which is not a bad guess considering the modern estimation placed it along the Hercules border in the constellation Lyra. This direction is located very near the zenith on July evening, about 12, 20 degrees above the galactic plane. We take about a quarter of a billion years to complete one revolution around our Milky Way galaxy. And the Earth and our solar system has completed this trip about 18 times since the formation of our solar nebula a little more than 4.5 billion years ago. I always like to show people that on summer nights. So if you're out there in the evening and you see the summer triangle pattern, which is Vega, Altair, and Deneb, and you look up toward that brightest star, Vega. Vega, incidentally, is also famous in the sci-fi movie Contact from the 90s. That was where they were getting these, uh, Ellie Arroway was getting the signal from. But Vega is also the direction that our solar system, Earth, the Moon, Jupiter, all the planets and asteroids, everything in our solar system, in the sun, we're moving off in that direction toward the, the solar apex uh, in, in that point. It's something to look at. I think there's, there's points in the sky. You're not going to see anything, but just to point off and say, we know this based on looking at the proper motion of other stars and analyzing these things from the time of William Herschel that, yes, we are, we are, along with all the other stars you see, which are part of our Milky Way galaxy, we're like pedestrians on a busy sidewalk all going around our galaxy. Now, that orbit takes a quarter of a billion years. I and mean, you think about, we've only done that uh, you know, a little over a dozen times in the, since the Earth formed. The last orbit around, there were not humans here a quarter of a billion years ago. I mean, it, it's, it's uh, and then you, you start projecting forward and you think, you know, we're just looking at this little point in space and time that pretty much is going to look the same way uh, when we were born as when we die, uh, you know, in an average 72 year lifespan. But then I think, uh, a quarter of a billion years from now, the Earth will still be here, but what will be here? You know, it's kind of, it really makes you think those mind-blowing thoughts when you're looking further out. 
another interesting bit, like I said, we did some astronomy lore. I think I might wrap up with this. Um, every ancient culture has their myths as just what the dusky summertime plane of the Milky Way galaxy really is. To the Greeks, it was the milk of the goddess Hera spat out, splattered out across the night sky, hence the name Milky Way. To the Native North Americans, it was the path of the celestial hunting grounds of the afterlife lit by campfires of deceased warriors. The Chinese saw the Milky Way as the big, brilliant magpie bridge. And actually, there's a section in August where I broke down the bit about the, the myth of the magpie bridge uh, with the Chinese. Uh, actually, the stars, Deneb and Altair, are the separated lovers on either side of the river. But that's in the August lore. Um, but you've never really seen the core of our galaxy until you're near the equator where it rides high overhead on July evenings. There you can witness the glorious backbone of night holding up the vault of the sky from the mythology of the Kung people of the Kalahari Desert. The Peruvian Incas had an even more unique set of constellations centered around the Milky Way. They saw shapes not in the patterns of stars, but the dark lanes carved out by gas and dusk. In this schema, the negative dark spaces along the Milky Way became the shadows of llamas, foxes, and snakes. And actually, I managed to include a photo I had taken in uh, Cusco at the museum showing this uh, idea. And I always thought it was an interesting idea that the Peruvian Incas saw not the most people see the stick patterns of the constellations as Orion the Hunter, Leo the Lion. They actually had a more ingenious system where when they're looking at the Milky Way and you're seeing those dark shadow patches, which are the dusty places that are blocking the stars behind them. They saw this as kind of a shadow light play where those outlines were actually, um, you know, their, their constellations existed not in the bright lanes, but the dark negative spaces. It's a very artistic idea when you think of thinking of the, the dark negative spaces out there between the bright stars and these uh, clouds of dust and gas that was their constellations. They were seeing it as kind of a shadow play of animals moving across the Milky Way. So that was, uh, you know, it's, like I said, my fondest uh, hope is whoever, if you buy the book and go out there and use it, that this will be something that you'll use at the eyepiece. And, um, you know, it'll, it'll become tattered and worn. Maybe you'll buy a second one, <laughs> but uh, that's, uh, that's the book. So I'll pass it over to you, Eileen, and uh, if we have any questions out there. We do have some questions. So um, okay. I will start with the first one, which is, what is a good uh, beginner micro or telescope, telescope for an area that has some light pollution? Um, you know, I like to go out and first learn the constellations. I would always advise people to uh, learn the sky. It's something that you'll keep in, you know, forever, that you'll learn how the sky moves in the seasons. Um, to get a telescope, I would actually get something as simple to, as you can. If you, you know, it depends what you want to do because um, some telescopes, if you think you want to get into astrophotography, you want to get something that's going to track. That's a, the I don't have one up right now, but that's where you get into in the first book. I think I actually have a good diagram of it. Um, you get into a lot of people overlook mounts. Mounts are probably as at least as important as optics. And I'm frozen again, but I'm going to keep talking. <laughs> Assuming that we can hear you, uh, we can see you. <laughs> okay, it's the video is just frozen. I don't know if you can see my video, but um, actually, that's optical designs. I mean, there's refractors and reflectors. The biggest thing you'll hear amateurs astronomers talk about is their aperture size. That is the size of the mirror. This one has a four and a half mirror inch mirror in the back. Um, be wary of telescopes that are department store scopes that advertise by magnification that say magnifies 10,000 times or a thousand times. That's usually you're actually using very low magnification. You want a nice wide generous field of view. I usually don't use over 100 magnification because and the thing is the problem with magnification is it also magnifies if you're seeing is really bad and turbulent. So um, Get like a good Dobsonian if you're going to get a telescope and you're not quite sure you want to go, uh, where you want to go for about, a Dobsonian is a type of mount, but they're mounted on a Lazy Susan. They're very simple. So you have something you can push and aim. Uh, they're mounted uh, on a Lazy Susan type mount. It's a Newtonian telescope, meaning it's a reflector, it has the eyepiece on the barrel on the side. And they're a very easy scope to maintain and very intuitive as far as aiming and pushing around. Now, 
if you think you're going to get into astrophotography, though, like I said, uh, you want something that's going to track. Um, you might want something like a good portable refractor. Uh, those are, are very um, easy to, uh, you know, the, there's advantage. It's like, I always say it's the same as like with automobiles. You know, you think about what people say, why are there all these different types of telescopes? I say, well, they all serve a different purpose. Uh, a sports car can go really fast, but you can't go to Ikea and pick up things with a sports car. A pickup truck works better for that. There's an application for things. Say a good short tube refractor on an equatorial mount is good for doing deep sky astrophotography. Like say this one, for example, is very good for deep sky objects. It's terrible for doing the planets because the planets are very tiny targets. This is good for things that are wide and extended out across the sky. For, for tiny objects, you want something that's going to maybe a refractor with a good uh, focal length. You get into something like an F10 focal length. A good all-around telescope, too, is a, a, like an 8-inch Schmidt Cassegrain. I had one of those for years. And you can do planetary. You can do some photography. You can do deep sky. Uh, they're very – that's a good trade-off between uh, factors, you know, uh, so something like that or a 6-inch Newtonian, 6-inch mirror Newtonian will give you acceptable views of planetary objects and deep sky objects. So I hope okay. that answers your question. This um, first book, there is a whole bit on uh, types of telescopes and choosing a telescope. Now, technology changes really quickly. Like these types of telescopes weren't even out yet. Um, but I think a lot of the advice, at least in that section, is still pertinent. Um, our next question is about with so many problems and turmoil that is going on right now. Why do you think uh, you would, someone would be interested in astronomy? What can we take away from it? Um, I, I think it goes back to a lot of, you know, it's just, it, it's something you can still do um, with the current situation. Like I said, I, I always manage to observe even being pretty much down on lockdown. Uh, you can still do astronomy. Um, we did, uh, I showed off Comet Neowise last night uh, on the rooftop, and actually there was some other passers-by. We were all masks, and we all maintained physical distance and everything. But, uh, you know, it's, it's something that kind of brings us together as far as a species to look out and say, yeah, there's a lot of inward-looking things we do, which is uh, uh, fine, you know, getting a, maybe a little, um, you know, existential. But there's uh, also a lot of outward looking things we do. And I think it's important, you know, as a species, we keep doing those sort of things where we're looking out and, uh, and you know, they're launching a Mars rover in a couple of days that ties in with space, you know, and we're doing those sort of, it's an international effort, NASA's doing it. But I think it's important we do those sorts of things. And I think it's important just, you know, because if we don't do those sorts of outward looking exploration uh, endeavors as a species, I think that's, that's, uh, we're going to turn inward on ourselves and you know, that's not a good direction is uh, historically when you look at societies, when they, when they break off and decide that we're going to just uh, turn inward, you know, uh, and that usually uh, that a particular culture becomes irrelevant and kind of just goes back in history. My own thoughts, but. Okay. We're going to switch to um, uh, someone who's uh, asking um, our, 10 by 50 binoculars good for backyard stargazing. And this person's in an area where there's a lot of light pollution. They live in a city. Oh, yeah. 10 by 50s are excellent. I had a pair of 7 by 50s, which are even a little uh, less powerful. Uh, those are the, your standard birding hunting binoculars. When I was a teenager, I, I had a, a pair of my dad's 7x 50s for years. And binoculars are wonderful because it's a wonderful intermediary between learning the night sky and getting an actual telescope. A, a pair of binoculars requires no setup. It gives you an intuitive view of the sky, basically just magnifying. Incidentally, the numbers, when, as I always like to try to explain, especially when you get into astrophotography, you can get down the tech hole, and guys love to talk about you know, a lot of the, the technical aspects. Uh, 7x50, what we're talking about, 10x50, is simply the first number in binoculars is your magnification, is your your eyepiece magnification, and 50 is your is the aperture, the important like how wide that aperture is. So essentially, think our eight millimeter pupil to enlarge it up to 50 millimeters, you get much more light gathering power, and that's the whole idea of those type of optics. But 
those are excellent. I have a pair of, I don't have them sitting over here, um, image stabilized binoculars, which are very neat little toys. I've had these for about 20 years. I, I will warn you, once you look through them, uh, they're not cheap. But um, <laughs> once you look through them, you won't want standard binoculars because what these do, it's a wonderful sort of technology that um, when you look through them, there's a button on the side and you hold the button down and it stabilizes the image. It's kind of like video stabilization. It's the same idea in cinemato cinematography. But so instead of, you know, you have your hand jitter when you're holding binoculars and the object kind of jitters a little bit, the image kind of floats and you can see much more detail. And the first time, like I said, I, I've used those, I'm so used to those when I grab a pair of normal binoculars, I reach for the button and I'm kind of like, there's no button on these. So it's, uh, be forewarned, if you use a pair of those, you won't ever want to get, but, but seven, 10 X50s are good binoculars to start with, yes. Um, what are your thoughts about the Starlink satellites? And they <laughs> seem to be unpopular with the astronomers. Yes, I've, uh, I've written about the Starlink satellites actually for um, Sky and Telescope Universe today. I've observed Starlink passes. Starlink, uh, for anyone that's unfamiliar, um, uh, SpaceX and Elon Musk are launching a set. I think another set's going up in a week or two. Um, they're, they're launching 60 at a time of these little communication satellites. The idea is to provide, they're going up into low Earth orbit and they're to provide a, a kind of a worldwide internet service, something that can compete. This has been something they've wanted to do for decades, to have satellites that are providing worldwide uh, broadband. I can, I can tell you traveling, I'm a little excited in a way, if, if I can get, ever get Starlink on my uh, mobile phone, I've been out to some pretty, I can tell you in the rest of the world, they, they don't have the type of, uh, you know, some places are more connected. China and Korea, when we say 5G, they're at the next thing beyond 5G. Uh, America, we're kind of in the middle. Uh, places out there, when you go out in the desert in Morocco, you might not have any kind of internet connection. So I'm back and forth that, yes, the problem they're having is these turned out to be very bright when they launched them. And they want to put up thousands of these things. So you're seeing them streaking through astrophotography mm -hmm. images. They're really eerie to see. I've watched uh, Starlink passes um, on occasion, and it's weird to see chains of satellites passing by, like what we call satellite trains. And I follow and watch satellites. That's its own little um, niche of amateur astronomy. There are amateur astronomers out there that do nothing but track satellites. And it's fascinating because every time they launch, they track classified satellites and things in low Earth orbit and flaring satellites and re-entries. And that's, uh, it just shows you, you can totally subspecialize in amateur astronomy if you want to. I kind of, since I write about it, I kind of dabble in all the little corners. So I do satellite <laughs> tracking on, on occasion too. But uh I kind of think it's good, um, my opinion on it. Um, it's kind of a reality that's coming because other companies like OneWeb want to launch these uh, constellations of satellites. I'm afraid that, you know, if we dial forward in a few decades, are we going to see a sky where there's more moving stars than real stars out there? Mm -hmm. That would be kind of the, uh, the worst case scenario yeah. that all uh, amateur and professional astronomers are afraid of. But then, you know, there's the other side too, that it's uh, if this technology, um, you know, even there's even places in the U.S. that you still can't get, you know, a good uh, Internet connection. So if uh, if it, I'm on the fence about uh, they tried to do this with the Iridiums, me and Fraser at Universe Today go back and forth. He's he's more on the I'm excited for Starlink to start operating. And I'm like, well, remember, the Iridium satellites were supposed to do the same thing. And it never really came to pass. Iridium became, these were launched in the 90s. They were famous because they used to flare and they were fascinating to kind of watch. But uh, they never quite came to, the problem is uh, mobile phone technology uh, proliferated faster through just cell towers uh, that was just cheaper and more economical. So satellite phones kind of became this niche thing that if you were on top of Mount Everest or if you were in the South Atlantic, you used a giant brick sized satellite phone but most, it didn't become something that everybody had in their pocket. So I'm kind of a wait and see to see what happens with it. I think what's gonna happen with a lot of these large telescopes, like the large synoptic survey that are going online to kind of clean these things out of the images, they're gonna have to use algorithms and computers to, and amateurs have pioneered that, amateur imagers have pioneered this technology. You can actually uh, run a program 
that will take satellite streaks and airline streaks out of your astro photo. It, it, it can identify them. It's smart enough to look at a, as you're stacking up these images and when it sees those streaks going through, I, I think there's probably going to be a technological workaround for it. Okay, we had, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this, but a question, any suggestions for viewing the Delta Aquard showers? Oh, meteor, the meteor shower. Yes, yeah, or that's, any of the meteor uh, showers this summer. Sorry about that. <laughs> the, the Delta Aquarids, I know totally what you're talking about because on my, I, I'm at Astro Guys with a Z on Twitter and every day I go through and I'm typically like just tweeting out what events are coming up? And yes, one of them was the Delta Aquarids. I don't know if you see the chart I'm showing, but uh, uh, there's the Alpha Capricornids. The Delta Aquarids are a decent shower. They're, uh, they have a zenithal hourly rate of 25 per hour, meaning um, the zenithal hourly rate is an ideal rate of how many you would see in an hour under ideal conditions. Now, a lot of things conspire to make sure that you're not looking under ideal conditions. First of all, the definition, zenithal hourly rate, meteors all radiate from a point called the zenith, uh, from uh, the radiant. And if the radiant was placed at the zenith, which is overhead, we talk in both of my books about like directions in the sky, the zenith is overhead, the nadir is underneath, you would see that many meteors under a dark sky with no moon. Uh, most of us don't observe from a pristine dark sky site. Um, a good meteor shower that's coming up, uh, the Delta Aquarids are worth getting up for. You usually see uh, more meteors in the morning than in the evening. The reason being, and we talk about the directions in the sky again, the Earth is rotated forward into its orbit. You think of the meteor stream is coming by. This is uh, debris, little dust-sized particles that a comet laid by as it crossed the orbit of the Earth, you know, thousands, hundreds of years ago. When the Earth plows into that, it starts, you get meteors that are hitting the atmosphere. The Earth is turned, you're, you're on the part of the Earth turned forward from midnight until noon. So from midnight until sunrise, you're looking forward into the stream that the Earth is passing into. Think of if you're driving um, through a snowstorm, you always see the snow particles coming, that Star Trek effect of all the, like, the stars and everything coming at you from the front when you're looking into your high beams or think in Florida, when you're driving down the highway on a, a July night, the, um, the front end of the car gets all the bugs, the bugs being the meteors and the car being the earth. So the earth is plowing through the stream of bugs. So uh, plowing through the stream of meteors. So the Delta Aquarids are cool. The Capricornids are cool. The Perseids in mid August are always a good shorefire bet. It's always one of the best meteor showers. Um, I have fond memories in northern Maine laying out with my parents and my brothers watching uh, Perseid meteors uh, in August because it, it comes in that time in the northern hemisphere where it's still warm to lay out. School hasn't gone back in. Um, doesn't look like school's going to go back in anyway, so you might as well lay out and watch meteors you know, at a good physical distance or with your quarantine bubble. Um, but, you know, yeah, and uh, the Geminids are good toward December. Um, the Leonids, the best meteor shower I ever saw was when I was deployed to Kuwait in 98, I saw a Leonid meteor storm. That was about a thousand, I estimated towards sunrise, about a thousand per hour. And when you're seeing a thousand per hour, you're seeing one every few seconds, which is like, you know, there's a meteor, there's one. We would see them from behind, like the desert floor would flash. And we went out behind our tent city, um, on an overseas military base like that at a forward operating location, everything is blacked out. You know, there's no lights or anything. So it's super dark. You're out there in the desert. And uh, I have never seen a meteor shower quite like that. It's uh, I had a major that was out there watching with me that even approached me a, a year or two later back when we were back at Ileson. And he still remembered that, that when he saw me, <laughs> he's like, he remembered the Leonid meteors. So it's like, it left, you know, that big of an impression. It is, I, I put up there one of the three, coolest things I've ever seen, along with a total solar eclipse, which was in 2017. We went to that one uh, here in the U.S. And uh, a good northern light display is probably uh, something. And I mean, uh, go up to the Arctic Circle. If you've never been up there, make an effort to go up there when, the, when there's a lot of solar activity and toward the fall or spring, so it's dark, and like Alaska or Iceland. And to see the curtains of, now I've seen good Northern Lights too, um, down from Maine and Northern Tier States. Sometimes they do come down that far, 
back in the 80s, the sun was very active, and we saw an amazing display from northern Maine. Uh, again, one that like it just would take your breath away to see. It's like a big colors, like curtains of yellows and reds, and like just swaying back and forth, almost eerie to see because there's no sound to it. So just to, to stand there and watch it was quite impressive. Uh, we had a question about um, any good stargazing apps that you can oh, yeah. recommend. Um, I use Stellarium on my laptop. Uh, the the base templates for these maps were actually done via Stellarium. That's that's how they first had life in the book before I went and uh, and did my annotations in Illustrator and and did the uh, final original maps. But uh, Stellarium is free. Um, Starry Night has a little deeper database, but it's not free. It's another one I use in on my phone. I use um, a nifty app for satellite tracking that also has a lot of other sky objects. It's called Heavens Above. That's a cool one. Um, I know there are other Google Sky. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of other Sky Viewer apps out there that every time I talk about satellite tracking, somebody comes up with another one that I'd never heard of. But those are the primary ones that I'm usually going toward and using. And again, that, that changes. I'm in the Android world, so... Um, a lot of them. Uh, a friend of mine in India just released one called Cosmic Watch that was kind of nifty uh, that has a good uh, planetarium program. And it also gives you that, well, I was talking about looking, uh, a lot of the early star maps, if you look at a lot of middle medieval star maps, they illustrated as if it was, I talk about the imaginary sphere around the earth idea that is, it's an illusion, it's imaginary, of course, but it helps because we're from a, a geocentric perspective looking out from the Earth. They actually imagined a lot of their maps as looking inward, so you see them as a sphere looking inward. You kind of see this perspect perspective they had in medieval times. All that is to say his Cosmic Watch app has a setting on it, which I've never seen another astronomy app that gives you that inward looking perspective mm. as, as if the constellations from outside looking in, uh, as well as the, the more traditional you would use for observations, standing on the earth, looking outward toward the sky. So I thought that's kind of a nifty little thing. It's like, uh, if you've done a lot of celestial cartography, I'm kind of like, I see what you did there. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually have uh, a, a good post for us to wrap up on. Um, okay. One of the uh, uh, viewers who actually I, I happen to know is one of our customers says, Astronomy has the virtue of forcing people to think about a common humanity and a universe of so much more than ourselves. Um, yeah, I would totally okay. agree with that. Yeah, and he um, also then has a link to uh, Astronomy and Civilization in the New Enlightenment, Passions of the Skies. So if people want to read more about that, um, he's got a link for that in the notes. And um, just FYI for everybody, we will have um, this uh talk posted up on our website. Uh, so okay. if you missed any of it, I know uh, one person did uh, send me a message that they were having a problem with it on their um, on their side uh, with it looping through. Uh, okay. So it, uh, it will be up there for other folks and we will share it with other people so they can watch it. Um, and one of the folks commented that this sounds like a great book. So uh, I think we can well, all say, you. yes, it is. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, David, for taking time out. I know you were uh, worried about a, a storm kind of knocking out the power. It seems like everything's okay at your place right Everything's now. Everything seemed pretty stable, so yeah. Good, 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 good. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. And um, we hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Bye. Right. Thank you.